that song, His Mercy Reigns. And that's really from our text today that we see about the Lord's mercy. We continue our series from 1 Peter, and today our text is chapter 2, verse 10. The title of the sermon is, But Now. And in these, this one verse, Peter encourages the dispersed believers by sharing two contrasts, a contrast of past condition and current condition. And from this sermon, salvation in Jesus Christ is life-changing. And we need to know that and understand that uh, just completely. This thought, Christ transforms. He transforms. And he does in the area of familia and in the area of mercy. And that's what we see in this verse. We are changed and transformed in family life and in mercy and by mercy, his mercy. Our text last week and this week has been 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let me have you read with me our text today, which is verse 10, what I just read to you. Let's read it in unison. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If I would give you a literal Greek rendition of this verse, it would say this, once you not people, but now God's people, not mercy, but now mercy. There are two coordinating conjunctions in this verse. Last week in verse 9, we shared with you one coordinating conjunction and one subjunctive conjunction. And uh, in, here in verse 10, there are two coordinating conjunctions, and it means that there's parallel thoughts. They're connected. They're equal in thought, what is being said here. Since we started this series in First Peter, I've talked to you about the dispersed. This is to whom Peter is writing. Most of these dispersed believers were from Rome, the region around Rome. And if you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, it will tell you they were dispersed into these various regions. And persecution was coming from the Roman government. While Christ was here on earth, there was a time known as Pax Romana. Everything was at peace. The Roman government was in control. They could travel Everything was complete peace. Now a new emperor has come on the scene, and his name is Nero. I shared with you uh, his, uh, how crazy he was previously. He, would, uh, he blamed Christians for the burning of Rome, and he would actually take and, uh, believers, disciples of Christ, tie them to a stake, light them, and they would be the torches for travel at night along the roads. And believers were persecuted in this time. Now, we're right at the beginning of this time. Both Peter, the Apostle Peter, and the Apostle Paul are going to be martyred, killed, for the sake of Jesus Christ under this emperor, under Nero. So we're right at the beginning of this uh, persecution. And these Roman Gentile believers were dispersed out. Hence, Peter is writing to them to encourage them, to uplift them. Although it's not a prophecy or a fulfillment of a prophecy, most scholars believe Peter is using the same imagery here that Hosea used when he wrote to the Jews. Now, Hosea wrote to the Jewish people, and the prophecy, what was being said, 
what to the Jewish people is of the same imagery that Peter is saying to the Gentile people here. It's not a fulfillment of Hosea, but Peter takes these words and uses much of the same that Hosea used back in Hosea chapter 1, verse 6, verse 9, and verse 10. I'm not going to go through it or give you the thought today of a Hosea's story, but it is an amazing one, one beyond my comprehension. If you ever go and read the book of Hosea, do it sitting down. It's just um, incredible what God did to express his immense dissatisfaction with Israel and to show his incredible mercy to Israel. And it's a story that's hard to fathom. But Peter uses the same thought and analogy here in verse 10. Although intended for the Gentiles, you were not, now you are, you had not, now you have. Peter's getting the same truth across to these Gentiles as Hosea did to the Jewish people. And we see and understand this truth. Jesus Christ changes everything. He transforms life. If he hasn't changed your life dramatically, then you need to go back and check up on your salvation to be sure you have Jesus Christ. Because he changes it all. And the one who believes in Jesus Christ, is a disciple of Jesus Christ, is transformed. God is at work in their life. He, Philippi, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's doing his job. And of all people who know how to do their work well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a great transaction from our salvation that we see and have here in verse 10 that Peter shares. I want you to see first, that first one is, you were not family, now you are God's family. You were not family, now you are God's family. And Peter says, he writes, led by the Holy Spirit, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Peter makes it very clear these people were not a part of the body of Christ. The word people is the word in general for people there. It's just a general term. It refers to a gathering, a group. And Peter clearly lets it be known that this group was not a group before, but now in Jesus Christ, it is now a group. And that's the Greek word for church, ekklesia. It's a called out group of believers. That's what the church is. And every local church is a called out group from the world to be a people that are God's. God's people. And this thought of mankind, we are born in sin, we choose sin from our birth, and therefore we need a Savior, one who forgives sin and places us in the body of Christ, the family of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that does this work when we come to him asking to be saved. Nicodemus asked Jesus, John chapter 3, verse 7, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus' response to Nicodemus was, you must be born again. And if you read John chapter 3, the first part of that, the idea Jesus gives Nicodemus is we must be born again of man of water which is we have physical birth and we must be born of the spirit we must have spiritual birth those of you who are women that have given birth it's very memorable to you you don't ever forget Cindy and I the other week were talking about the birth of our kids you know what I remember they served us a steak dinner 
after she gave birth, before she's dismissed from the hospital, they have a rose on the table, and we had, that's what I remember about the birth, okay? <laughs> yeah, you women are shaking your head at me. She did all the work, and that's what happens when we come to Christ. There is a point, a moment, where birth takes place, and you know it. You know you are his. You must be born again. And then I said that the, uh, the Holy Spirit does this work. Read with me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Let's read it in unison. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's at that moment that the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, takes you and places you into Christ, into his family. That birth takes place. And what happens is the Holy Spirit seals you. The word means marked out, to be marked by. You are marked out by God's Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. Till that day. And that means you're eternally secure. And in this text, Peter is addressing these Gentile believers who were despised and Gentiles were looked down upon. They were hated by the Jewish people. And they were now chosen elect to be part of God's family. And it's Peter who at Pentecost preached all tribes, all nations, all races can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now you have to understand this. Once you were not a people, no one is part of the body of Christ, the family of God, until they receive this gift of salvation. Till they receive what Jesus Christ has offered for them as a free gift. You can call it born again. You may term it saved. These are all biblical terms. You may call it in Christ, being placed in Christ. That's what happens when one receives Jesus Christ. And the gift is extended to all, everyone it's offered to, but not everyone chooses to receive Jesus Christ. And you must receive him to be part of the family of God. Let me show you Paul's writings in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, 15 to 17. This is very clear, and Paul makes it very clear. But the free gift is not like the trespass. So this free gift of salvation is not like your sin. For if many died through one man's trespass, which that would have been Adam and Eve, representing us in the garden, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, brought judgment. But the free gift following many trespasses, trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive, notice the word, receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. It doesn't get clearer than that. We are all sinners through Adam. He represented us. And many sinful trespasses have took place. But then Jesus Christ came on the scene. And Jesus Christ paid for our trespasses. 
He took the condemnation that was ours, that we were due, and now offers this free gift of salvation to anyone, to all who will receive the abundance of grace, receive the free gift of righteousness through the one man, Jesus Christ. You live in a day where people will say, there are many ways. Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh. Straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but through me. Because Jesus paid the price. Read Romans 6, 23 with me in unison. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We enter the family of God by asking his forgiveness, receiving the free gift of salvation in and through Jesus Christ alone. I love birthdays. And my adopted son's birthday is coming up in the coming month. And we're going to give him a gift. He's into these Lego, big time Lego builds. So we bought him all these Star Trek Lego builds and they're monstrous. And he just sits there and loves it. Well, we'll give him the gift. When is it his? When he reaches out his hands and says, thank you, Grandpa, and takes it. And Grandpa isn't going to take it back from him. It's giving it to him. He doesn't have to earn it. He doesn't have to pay for it. He doesn't have to work for it. Free gift. That's the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. Our sin brings death and eternal separation from God But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad? Listen, it isn't money that gets you to heaven. He could have set the standard at a million dollars. Only the rich get there. It isn't your works that gets you, get you to heaven. You would endlessly be doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and wondering, when have I done enough? Have I done enough this week? You don't live under that legislation. He could have said, it's only this race. And you were born outside of that. No. Once you were not family, now you are God's people. And when you received this free gift, you were not his people. Now you are his people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's why when you come in this place, there is no higher calling, there is no greater message, there is no other truth to be proclaimed except Jesus Christ saves. Number two, you were not favored, now you are God's favored. And this ought to make you stand up and shout. You were not favored, now you are favored. The end of verse 10 says, Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There's no special grace here that some would teach. All grace is very special. The Apostle Apostle Peter uses the word mercy in the second half of this verse. The meaning of the word mercy is literally to feel pity, to show compassion. And that's what Jesus Christ did. God saw mankind sinful 
And he had pity on us. He had compassion on us. So much so, he gave his perfect son, Jesus Christ, to die a horrendous death of crucifixion for your sin. You've heard me say the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is receiving what I don't deserve. Mercy is not receiving what I do deserve. And that's how you know the difference between the two. And Peter is emphasizing here that you have an incredible and amazing blessing. You are part of God's family. At one time past, you made a decision to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ for your sins and you asked him to forgive you of your sin and therefore you will not and do not receive judgment for your sin that's mercy mercy is not receiving what I deserve because of your sins you deserve punishment judgment condemnation eternal separation in the place the Bible calls hell, the lake of fire. We deserve that because we can't measure up to holiness, to what God expects and accepts. But mercy stepped in. Amen? Mercy stepped in. These two words, mercy... In the same are the same word in the Greek, but there's a different tense. If we go back to the verse, let me see if we get there. If we go back to the verse, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That second word, mercy, the last word of verse 10, is in the aorist. It's aorist tense. And that means it's past completed action so there's a time in the past when you received Christ as Savior and from that time forward you have received mercy and there's a difference there in those two words because it's past action mercy is not getting the judgment rendered for sin it's not receiving the punishment for your sin. Let me dwell just a minute on your sin. <clears throat> there are the sins of lust, coveting, lying, deceit, favoritism, lack of giving, lack of compassion, sins of stealing, times you've gotten angry, when you became envious, jealous, laziness, times you were unkind, every single swear word that has come out of your mouth, the times you have been impatient, times you were gent not gentle, but dealt roughly with someone. Get the picture? Sins are many. And let me think, have you think with me for a minute. Let's say you're 55 years old. And we'll just wipe out age 1 to 5 because you were little. Okay? Maybe didn't know better. So we take 50 years and we multiply it. One sin per day. So 365 sins multiplied by 50 years is more than 18,000 sins. 18,000. Now that's if you've sinned one time a day. Stand up if you've only sinned once a day. Exactly. Now I only mention sins of commission. Sins of omission are when I should have done something and I didn't. I should have gave. I, I, I should have shared Jesus Christ with them. He's the answer for their problem, and I didn't. And it just multiplies. Sin upon sin 
upon sin. And Jesus says, for all your posted banners where every sin is written down and known, Jesus steps in and says, I paid for them. Covered. Read with me Romans 8, verse 1, together. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I shared with you the words for salvation. Born again, saved, and one of them I used was in Christ. There it is. There's no condemnation. That's the word judgment. You will not be judged for your sin if you are in Christ Jesus. Every one of those thousands upon thousands of thousands of sins you have committed, they were paid in full on the cross of Calvary when Jesus was crucified for you. Every whip that went across his back, every thorn on his head, the nails in his hands represented your sin. And Jesus paid for them all. We deserve the punishment for those sins, but Jesus says, I cover them with my blood because you have received my free gift. Mercy is so important. We do not deserve, we do not receive what we deserve. This is why it's important to teach your children accountability. It truly is one of our society and culture's problems today. No one wants to be held accountable for their wrong. When you teach your child they did wrong and you use a timeout or some form of discipline, at some point you can teach mercy with that. Let them understand what mercy is. You did this. You disobeyed me. Here's what you deserve. But I'm not going to do that to you. And you teach them that's mercy. You deserve it. But here's what God does for us. And I'm not going to pass that judgment on to you. And then if you want to teach them grace, you go to the fridge and get some ice cream and give them a bowl of ice cream. That's grace after they've done wrong. Not getting what they deserve, receiving multitude of blessing on top of it when not deserved. That's grace. And that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. God in Jesus Christ has brought us into what we know as family. And God in Jesus Christ has given us favor even when we didn't deserve it. The free gift of salvation. What a thrill. A preacher I enjoy listening to is Dr. Chuck Swindoll. He shared the following illustration. During the reign of Oliver Cromwell, the British government began to run low on silver for coins. Lord Cromwell sent his men to the local cathedral to see if they could find any precious metal there. <laughs> After investigation, they reported the only silver we could find is the statues of the saints standing in the corners. And then the radical, outspoken statesman of England replied, Good, we'll melt down the saints and put them out into circulation. And honestly, Cromwell had pretty good theology there. The greatest impact you can have is to be melted down understanding I don't deserve what I have 
and go out into circulation and share the good news, the grace, the mercy of Jesus Christ. That's what they need. And if you are impacted deeply by his grace and mercy, we ought to be the first ones on the, on the front lines to let others know there's hope. There's hope. And it's found only in Jesus Christ. Mercy is God's saints, me and you, circulating in a society full of sinful, unrepentant sinners who need what you have. That's the greatest message you can carry. Anything else is substandard. The answer for our society, the answer for mankind, the answer for your family, the answer for salvation, the answer for eternal life is only Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Oh, friend, if you've received the free gift, you are so blessed. You are so blessed. Don't let anything or anybody rob you of this. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. See, the problem is, here's the problem. Most of you think, well, I'm pretty good. I'm not so bad. Look at them. There's your problem, because your pride lifts up, and you forget how sinful we really are, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and sins are covered. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Oh, and he's not going to hold one of them not going to hold you accountable for one little sin you've committed of the 18,000s of them because they're covered they're covered with his blood thank the Lord I close with this story it comes out of the Bedouin culture the Bedouins are, it's an Aramaic name for desert dwellers. When I visited Israel years and years ago, we were out in the desert and I was approached by the Bedouins. And they always want to sell you something. They want to take something from you, but they love your money. So they carry these trinkets and jewelry, and I bought Cindy some jewelry uh, from the Bedouins just so I could say, I did that. And today I'm saying I did that. <laughs> And I still have that bracelet that I bought from them. And they live just out running from place to place across these, these desert areas. During a heated argument, a young Bedouin struck and killed a friend of his. Knowing the ancient inflexible customs of his people, the young man fled across the desert under the cover of darkness seeking safety. He went to the black tent of the tribal chief in order to seek his protection. The old chief took the Arab in. The chief assured him that he would be safe until the matter would be settled legally. The next day, the young pursuers caught up with him, demanding the murderer be turned over to them. They would see that justice would prevail. But the chief protested and said, I have given my word. But you don't know whom they killed, they countered. I have given my word, the chief repeated. And one of them at that point blurted out, He killed your son. And the chief was deeply and visibly shaken with the news. 
He stood speechless, speechless with his head bowed for a long time. And the accused and the accusers were curious as they waited breathlessly for what he might say or do. Finally, the old chief raised his head. And here's what he said, and I quote, Then he shall become my son, and everything I have will one day be his. That's mercy. And this is our conclusion to the sermon. The young man certainly didn't deserve the mercy and love he just received. Neither do we deserve the mercy of God. Thank the Lord he showed us mercy. Jesus took the death we earned and the death we deserved. And we sit here in love with Jesus Christ, rejoicing with certainty that he called us, he saved us, and he's taking us to heaven to be his family forever. Hallelujah. We do not deserve it, but the Father has given us all the riches of the kingdom because his Son died for us. And God's mercy stepped into our lives. God's mercy forgives and remembers no more all our wrongs. Do you have God's mercy? Do you rejoice in being part of God's family? Do you know that with certainty? Jesus Christ transforms and extends us mercy every day. Receive the free gift of salvation if you have never done so. If you have a spiritual need, please come and talk. Share it with someone. Let us pray for you. And may we rejoice and go out bearing the message of mercy and grace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you paid it all for us. Thank you for the truth of salvation, that it's a free gift. We love you today. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.